What the fuck? How did you get in my house? Well, as long as you're here, I'd like to share a story with you. Um, it is a story called Nisekoi, written by Naoshi Komi and published in Weekly Shonen Jump for a few years. Uh, it has a pretty interesting premise and starts off pretty strong, but is ultimately held back by a few critical flaws that I would like to discuss. But before we can understand the train wreck that is Nisekoi, we have to understand what Nisekoi is. So I'm going to start with a brief plot summary. Our main character is a boy by the name of Ichijo Raku, and he's a pretty normal teenager. Uh, he's in school. He's got a crush on a girl in his class. He's the son of a Yakuza boss. But his very normal life is going to take a very strange turn when he gets off on the wrong foot, or shall I say, the wrong knee with the new transfer student, Kirisaki Chitoge. Yes, for the next three years, our friend Ichijo will be the main protagonist in a poorly written rom-com manga. When Raka was five years old, he made a promise with a girl that he fell in love with at five years old. They promised that when they met once again, they would get married. And then he took a lock pendant and she took the key so that when they met up once again, they could unlock it and get married. Again, this is five-year-olds that made this promise. You listen! Now, 10 years later, he's 15 and in high school. And he does not remember the name or face of the girl he made the promise with, but he still carries around the lock and he still remembers that promise. But there is a small problem. As it turns out, there is a new gang in town that is fighting with Raku's Yakuza family. They're shooting at each other, there's explosions going on, there is blood on the streets. But Raku's dad, the boss of the Yakuza gang, is actually very close friends with the leader of the new gang in town. And they don't want their gangs to keep fighting. So these two chuckleheads come up with a great fucking plan, let me tell you. These two bosses say, hey Raku, you're gonna date the daughter of the gang boss for three goddamn years. And the power of your love will stop our gangs from fighting. And I already have a problem with this. I know we just started, but I, I have to talk about this. How much of a beta male cuck do you have to be as a Yakuza boss that the low level members of your gang won't listen to what you have to say? The Yakuza don't mess around like that, okay? Do you know what happens when you don't listen to the boss of a Yakuza gang? And every time you screw up, you gotta chop again. So. Everyone in that Yakuza should be running around with the fucking stubs for hands, but no, they all just get away with it because this guy has no control over his family, apparently. But I am going to have to let it slide because it is far and away not the worst example of poor writing in this story. Let's continue for now. As if it isn't bad enough that Raku has to pretend to be in a relationship for three goddamn years because his dad has no control over his Yakuza boys, it turns out the daughter of the gang boss is Kirisaki Chitoge, the new transfer student who kicked him in the face. Yeah. They don't get along, all right? They hate each other. They're calling each other names. She's hitting him. They, they do not get along. But now they have to pretend to be in a relationship for three years. But this presents a rather difficult problem for poor Raku because he is actually in love with the girl in his class named Onodera. He's been in love with her since middle school. And also there's the possible promise girl. Does, he doesn't know who that is, but this guy's got a horny little dick, let me tell you. <laughs> but of course Raku and Chitoge do agree to go along with the plan because uh, if not, people will die. And that's, that's no good, you don't want that. <laughs> So now that we understand our basic set pieces, let's try to flesh out Raku as our main character. Uh, he likes to cook. He's in love with Onodera, like I said. He's a very nice, generous man. He's always there to help people out. Uh, he's a good, good dude all around. But really, there's only two things you really need to know about this guy. Uh, the first one is that every girl ever wants to fuck him. I'm talking like every girl that has a vagina wants his penis inside of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a really gross way of putting it, but um, but it's true. 
<laughs> you might have thought from what I've explained so far that there are two, possibly three main love interests in this story, but no! There's six! Six girls want to get on this guy's dick! Love triangle! Baby, this is a straight love heptagon! Pretty much the only girl in this story that doesn't want to fuck him is uh, Ruri, uh, and that's because Ruri uh, has a brain and thinks about things from time to time. Uh, but it's okay because Raku isn't interested in her either uh, because again, she uses her brain and girls who are intelligent are very unattractive. Straight up unfuckable. <laughs> God damn it, I'm gonna get canceled for this video. The other thing you need to know about Raku is that he has uh, the memory of a goldfish. <laughs> It's actually pretty incredible that he remembers to breathe most of the time. I'm serious, this shit gets ridiculous. The first example is the whole promise situation I mentioned before. Again, he promised some girl when he was five that when they met again, they would get married. Uh, the problem is he doesn't remember her name or face. He only remembers the promise that they made together and how she made him feel, which there's a lot of baggage there that I'm not gonna talk about. Were this the only example of his terrible memory, I could just accept that he was five years old and it's completely valid he forgot her name and face, but as it isn't, uh, I do have to dissect it a little bit. Let's talk about the lock thing that he carries around all the time. First of all, um, it's big and metal. If I were to guess, I'd say it probably weighs between five and 10 pounds. Also, it's got a very pointy tip. If you fell on this thing the wrong way, it could absolutely impale you through the chest and kill you. If you're wearing this heavy motherfucker around your neck every single day for 10 years, don't you think you would think about the person who gave it to you every single day for 10 years as your skeleton slowly warped under the weight? But if you want to argue that he was five years old when they made that promise and that after 10 years, it is totally valid that he forgot her name and face, that's fine. I'm willing to accept that because I have more examples. You see, it turns out uh, Raku actually met all six of the love interests when he was at that age of five years old. Um, how many of those girls do you think he actually remembers from that time? I'm actually amazed the number is this high. It's pretty incredible when you know as much as I know about this guy. <laughs> One of them he remembers because they have a closer kind of like brother-sister relationship and don't worry, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, the other one he only remembers because she talks like a hick. In fact, he, he actually doesn't remember her at all at first until she slips up and starts talking like a hick because she's lost her accent since then. And then she slips up and he's like, wait a minute, but fine. If you want to sit there and tell me again, he was five years old. This was 10 years ago. It's pretty valid that he would forget all these names and faces. And if you want to accept that, that's fine. I think it's bullshit, but we can move on because I still have more. How about you try this one on for size? Uh, again, he is in love with Onodera in his class and it turns out that she has a key that possibly goes to the lock that he carries. And so he asks her directly, Onodera, are you the girl that I made a promise with? And she says, I'm not sure, but I hope I am. And then they get interrupted in the middle of their conversation and he forgets about it for a year and a half. <laughs> Put yourself in this guy's fucking shoes for a second, okay? You've been in love with someone for like upwards of a year at this point. And when you were a kid, you made a promise with the girl that when you met again, you'd get married. And then this girl that you had a crush on for a year comes up to you and says, not only do I think I'm the girl you made the promise with, I hope I am. Wouldn't that immediately set off alarms in your head like, what the fuck did they just say? I have to investigate this as soon as possible. Even if I get interrupted, it's gonna be on my mind nonstop until I can bring it up at the next possible opportunity, but no! He forgets about it for a year and a half until it's convenient to bring it up again. God fucking damn it. But I'm also running on the assumption that he actually cares about the promise, which I'll, I'll go back and forth on that too because he loses the goddamn lock constantly. There's like three separate instances in the story where he loses the locket and then doesn't notice that it's gone for like a couple hours, even like half a day. And I just, I, I, I cannot let that slide.
Again, this thing has to weigh like five, 10 pounds and he wears it every single day. I wear this ring every single day. I've worn it every day since I was 15 years old. I don't make it out of my apartment building without noticing I forgot to put it on. And you're gonna tell me that this guy doesn't notice that this giant heavy fucking pendant is missing for hours? Come on, he must not care that much about it then. <laughs> this last one's actually my favorite. Um, so it turns out the whole promise of like the lock and key and getting married thing comes from a book that all the kids read when they were young. Uh, none of them can remember the entire book or the entire story and the version of the book that they find is like missing pages. So it's kind of like part of the plot points like they eventually start finding more pages and they can't find the last page and figure out the ending. Um, Raku's mom fucking wrote the book <laughs> and he does not remember that. One of the other characters finds out and goes to talk to his mom. He never is like, wait, this is my mom's fucking book. I should just ask her about it. He never fucking thinks about it. I can't make this shit up. I'm not lying right now. I wish I could lie about this. It's too fucking funny. He doesn't remember, like seriously. I get it, they were young, but I can only excuse so much. You have to know what books your mom wrote if she's an author. Like, come on, man. <laughs> it's fucking ridiculous. Anytime the author like needs a plot twist, they just fall back on this memory loss bullshit. Like every time they need to introduce a new character or introduce a new plot point, it's just someone forgot about it. There's never anything more than that. If I am to give him a pass anywhere on his dog shit memory, uh, it would have to be on the whole forgetting all six girls things. Uh, because if I knew such flat and uninteresting characters, I would probably forget about them constantly too. And that is my segue to talk about the girls. Okay, so six love interests in this story. Uh, four of them actually have keys that potentially go to his lock, uh, but they can't figure out who has the real key because it's like jammed or something. This plot point really doesn't matter. It's kind of like a reason that they all come together, but at the end of the day, isn't important. So you really don't have to remember. I'm just gonna have all of their little icons and a little key under it. If you wanna remember who has a key and who, who doesn't, that's cool. I don't care. I'm really not gonna talk about it much. Okay, we'll start with Chitoge. Chitoge is obviously the one that he is in a pretend relationship with. Uh, she's also probably the most fleshed out of all the girls. She's written as like a proper entire character. Uh, and I like Chitoge. She's interesting, she's fun, I, she's cool. She likes to eat a lot. She likes action movies. Uh, she really likes ramen. Um, she really overreacts over really small things, but then if something really big is bothering her, she tends to ignore it or avoid it. I like this. This is like a proper character flaw or conflict that frequently comes up as part of her plot points. That's good. That's that's a that's a properly written character. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. When she first meets Raku, they really don't get along uh, for good reason because they basically have nothing in common. Uh, there's literally a chapter towards the end of the story where she plans a date around things that he likes and she has a miserable time. <laughs> like all the things they do together, she doesn't enjoy at all because they just, they have nothing in common, nothing whatsoever. They're basically complete and utter opposites. But of course she does end up eventually falling for Raku uh, and, and the reasons are incredibly vague. Uh, it's, it's basically just cause he's a very nice and a generous boy. Onodera is the girl that Raku is in love with. Uh, she is also pretty much the least interesting character of all. She basically has no personality. Her main personality trait is that she likes Raku. I'm not fucking kidding. There's really not a lot to her. Why does she love Raku? Well, he's very nice and <laughs> he's very generous. <laughs> Are y'all taking notes? This is all it takes to find someone who will, who will love you as much as you love them apparently. I'm, I'm not kidding here, I'm not, this isn't hyperbole. There's never specific reasons ever given. It's basically like every girl who falls in love with him is like, God, he's just so nice. <laughs> That's, there's really not a lot else to say about her. Uh, she's really bad at cooking. 
but really good at like decorating baked goods. That's not really important. It starts to kind of be, but never really is. Uh, the problem with Ododera is that she's a completely flawless character. She never makes a mistake. She, she has no personality whatsoever and she never does anything wrong. You write a character like this, it is a boring character. Everybody has flaws, everybody makes mistakes. Those mistakes are what make us as people and those mistakes are generally what make the interest and conflict within a story. Onodera doesn't really have conflict or interest. She is completely uninteresting. She is too perfect to be interesting. That's all I have to say about her. I don't like you, Onodera, you suck. <laughs> Tsugumi is up next and also probably the most infuriating of all the girls. Uh, get this, so everyone thinks she's a guy when they first meet her, but she also canonically has the biggest boobs of all of the girls. <laughs> like, come on, am I being an asshole here? By poking all these holes in this story, like, am I being an asshole by, by, by like, you can't do this. You can't say one day, like, that is a man. Okay, I have seen men. I've been around men. I've kissed men. I fucked men. That is a man. He's wearing pants. Women don't wear pants. Little fun fact for you, actually, in Japan, it is illegal for a woman to wear pants. If she does, she gets banished to the nether where she has to live with the piglins. And then turn around the next day and be like, <laughs> holy shit, dude. Those are some fucking bazoombas. Those are some gigantic knockers, my guy. Those are some <laughs> mega class Canadian milk bags, my dude. Like, it just seems so fucking stupid. She is a hitman, okay? She's part of the gang that is run by Chitoge's father, and she is Chitoge's bodyguard. And so she wears pants all the time because they're easier to move in. And yet at the same time, she carries her massive tits in a fucking lacy bra all the time. That doesn't make sense. And let's talk about that hitman thing for a second, okay? She is a professional hitman. In fact, she's one of the best in her entire gang. She has a nickname. She's known for being an amazing hitman. She's a female agent 47. But do you want to know the reason that she likes Raku? He, he called her cute. No one's ever done that. But it's so fucking stupid. I can't even keep a straight face. I can't even. It's so fucking stupid. <laughs> I'm not fucking with you. Like this is a person who has murdered people. She carries guns around on a regular basis. But this fucking prepubescent little bitch tells her, hey. I think you're pretty cute, and dude, it's a fucking flood in the panty zone, my guy. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's gonna flood! At one point, she like cooks for him, and she, he tries it and loves it, and he's like, you know what, Tsugumi? You'd, you'd make a great wife, dude. <laughs> And she just fucking gets set off by that. Like, oh my God, Rock was such a nice and sincere boy. Like, come on, dude. If you said that kind of thing to a female agent 47, you'd get fucking shot. <laughs> it, it would be one thing if it was established that she like wanted to be seen as a woman and didn't like constantly be mis being mistaken for a man, but no, she doesn't mind. It doesn't bother her. So why on earth does she just get set off? Like she's killed people. She has murdered people. And yet you call her cute once and she is fucking yours, dude. Like, come on, this doesn't make sense. Ah! Ah! So ultimately she ends up falling for Raku because he's very nice and generous. <laughs> I don't think the author's married. I couldn't dig up any information about like his personal life, honestly, but from what I could gather, he's not married. I'm not saying anything. I just want it like on the record. I do not believe this man has ever been in love. Tachibana is interesting. Like Onodera, her main character trait is that she wants to fuck Raku, uh, but that's like turned up to an 11 in her case. Tachiban is the one that he recognizes because she has the hick accent. Um, she fell in love with Raku when she was five uh, and then spent the last 10 years molding herself into the perfect woman for him. That is not a joke. That is a real thing. She like fixed her accent so she could sound more ladylike for him. She grew out her hair because he said that he liked girls with long hair. It's like, God, this isn't how women work. This isn't real. <laughs> this isn't, no. 
She's also mildly like super rapey, like constantly touching on Raku in public, even though he doesn't like it. And like at one point she fucking like kidnaps him. It takes him to a remote island without his consent so they can be alone together. Like, <laughs> I have to be that guy for a second. If we reversed the genders here and it was Raku who was touching on Tachibana or kidnapping her and taking her to a remote island so they could be alone together, would we be okay with that? I do like Tachibana for one thing. Uh, she actually serves a, an important role in the plot in some situations. All the other girls are constantly kind of jealous of her because she's willing to just say what she wants and go for what she wants without hesitating. And on the flip side, because she is like that, she doesn't like seeing when the other girls hold back their feelings or aren't willing to admit what they want uh, and will get in their face and berate them for it and often causes them to act upon their feelings. And I like that. Um, she actually serves a purpose towards the plot by impacting the other characters. In an ideal world, all six of these characters would in some way influence the others to push the ultimate two together, but that simply isn't the case. Tachibana is basically the only one who has that kind of impact, so I like Tachibana for that. Tachibana, you get a gold star. I'm taking off one of the, one of the points though because you're a bit rapey, so here you go, you get a four-pointed star. Good, good for you. Tachibana is also dying. She's like sick and dying. It's not like super important, but she she is like dying of some unnamed anime illness and I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's not super important. I'll talk about it when it matters. Haru is my favorite. Uh, she's kind of the best. I love Haru. She's great. Haru is unique among the girls because uh, she has an actual reason to like Raku uh, beyond him being very nice and generous, which don't get me wrong. She definitely likes that about him as well, but there's more to it than that. Whenever Haru's kind of in some trouble, Raku will always kind of just appear like a knight in shining armor to help her in her time of need. Uh, they both have an active interest in Japanese confections, both making and trying them. So he will often bring her stuff that he's made and ask her to try them and kind of give him advice on how to make them better. Uh, he also like remembers the shops that she likes sweets from and will like bring her those sweets. And they also both have an active interest in traditional Japanese style. Raku's house is very traditional Japanese and he dresses in a very traditional Japanese way at home. And Haru finds that fucking hot. She just is really all about that. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. A tasteful thickness of it. Oh my God. And when they spend time together, they end up having a lot of fun together and they you know, are laughing and smiling and it's, it's all very wholesome and cute. They they have an actual like back and forth kind of rapport as well as things in common, you know, the types of things that make up a relationship. So it makes sense that she kind of develops feelings for him. But unfortunately for Haru, she is just part of the plot kind of bloating and, and getting really fat and full of shit. So her romance really doesn't develop very far at all. The last girl is Yui. Uh, Yui kind of sucks because just like Onodera, her main personality trait is that she wants to fuck Raku. She does have a little bit more going for her, but not really. Raku actually remembers her. I, I was amazed by this. Like as soon as he saw her, he didn't need any refresher. He just immediately knew it was her. It was crazy, bro. Uh, and I, the, the main reason for that is because they have a close like brother sister relationship and uh, she wants to fuck him anyway. So that's that's pretty cool. She's two years older than everybody else and is like a super genius who uh, graduated college when she was like 14 years old and is also the head of a Chinese crime syndicate. So that's three crime syndicates being involved in this story now. Uh, but despite all that, she came to this town to be their teacher and also uh, live inside of Raku's house and sneak into his room and curl up next to him in bed at night. So. Incest, pedophilia, non-consent, dude, she's checking all the boxes. <laughs> There's really not much else to say about her. She's like really smart, everybody loves her. She kind of overworks herself, but that's it. She just really wants to fuck this, this 17 year old when she's 19. She shows up much later in this story. He was not 15 anymore. Now, again, whenever the author doesn't know what to do, they just add a random character that Raku forgot about. That's just the entire story. <laughs> 
All right, so let's summarize real quick. Uh, we have six girls for you to choose from, Raku. These three don't have a personality. This one might rape you. And this one is the only one that you have anything in common with whatsoever. So take your pick, you dumb asshole. <laughs> Anyway, he chooses the dumb blonde. give credit where credit is due. The ending of the story is reasonably compelling. Uh, it's actually very interesting to read through uh, and it would be really strong if you didn't stop to think about it much like at all. Haru and Tsugumi both have their plot lines wrapped up the same way. Uh, they both recognize their feelings for Raku and then they decide to bottle it up and not do anything about it in order to protect the person that they care about. For Tsugumi that's Chitoge and for Haru that's Onodera. I do not wish to be horny anymore. I just want to be happy. I don't have a problem with this in theory. The problem I do have is that neither of their affections ever impacted the main plot, like at all. Both of their feelings were just used for like stupid little gag bits and to occasionally have their own little subplots. For Haru, it's used a little more uh, valuably in that area. She has her own like inner monologue and deals with their feelings in her own way. But because it never impacts the main plot at all, it doesn't really have any importance, which means them having feelings at all doesn't have importance, which means them as characters don't really have any importance. And realistically, if you wrote them out of the story, you would have to change some things here and there, certainly, but the story wouldn't change because of their absence. That's just bad writing. I'm sure somebody's going to call me crazy for criticizing this in the first place, uh, because it's just a stupid harem manga, and that means that, you know, random characters can be interested in the main character and it doesn't have to mean anything, because that's just how harem mangas are. But I disagree with that. <laughs> It makes me sound like an insane person, but you know what? This was published in Shonen Jump, which is the gold standard for manga. And they had lazily written characters like this, which means I'm going to criticize it. I just noticed I forgot to pull this book out of my uh, bookcase, and I'm sure someone's gonna be confused by its existence. Uh, this book is called Son of Hitler. Uh, it's a story about if Hitler had a son who was then trained into an assassin to uh, kill Hitler. Uh, it is not a book supporting Hitler at all. It wasn't even a very good book, so. I just want to make that clear in case there's anybody who's seeing this in my bookcase and wondering about it. I do not like Hitler. <laughs> Hitler bad. YouTube don't demonetize me. I'm getting I'm getting this off the shot. <laughs> Yui actually confronts her feelings and confesses to Raku. Uh, I was in shock when this happened. I thought for sure that in the very next chapter Raku would like mishear her and then she'd be too embarrassed to say it again. But no, she actually properly confesses and confronts her feelings. Uh, then she gets rejected, so she sexually assaults him and moves out of his house. Great end to her plot line. <laughs> Tachibana also properly confesses her feelings. She's told him she loves him a bunch of times, but this time she was like, I wanna fuck you, dude. She gets rejected too, and then she succumbs to her curse and has to head out to find a purging stone. So she's out of the story for now, but she'll be back. That just leaves us with Chitoge and Onodera, which if you've been paying attention, were the only two that actually mattered to begin with and were the only two that should have ever been love interests, but this is a stupid harem manga, so that's where we're at. I'm gonna quickly summarize where we're at with the ending so that I can explain how it ends. Uh, I'm going to leave out a lot of details so for the sake of time, uh, so if anything doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. It probably wasn't explained to begin with. Okay, so at this point, Onodera and Chitoge both have feelings for Raku, and Raku has realized that he has feelings for both Onodera and Chitoge. Chitoge overhears Onodera telling an unconscious Raku that she's in love with him. Then she overhears Raku telling his best friend Shu that he's in love with Onodera. And so she's like, ah, oh, fuck. Well, I'm just the odd one out here, but I love him so much, I can't just leave this be. So what am I gonna do? Well, what does Chitoge do when she's faced with something difficult? She runs away from it. She heads to America to work for her mom's company instead of trying to face her feelings. I like this. It has already been established several times throughout the story that this is how she reacts to big problems. She runs away from them 
or avoids them. So it is smart to use her in this way. I like this. This is good. This is strong so far. But Raku wasn't having any of that shit. He is too nice and generous to just let you walk away. So he chases after her and they do eventually catch up to her. But uh, she foresees them coming and tries to run away again. That's when Tachibana reappears after having found the Lord Vessel. Tachibana does what Tachibana do. She berates Chitoge for trying to run away instead of facing her feelings. And that ultimately gets Chitoge to decide to turn back and face things properly. So again, I like this. This is consistent with Tachibana as a character. This is effective usage of that character. I like it, it's good. So finally, Chitoge, Raku, and Onodera are starting to come together. And then Onodera stops Raku and says, I'm in love with you, you big, nice and generous hunk of a man. And Raku's gotta be like, oh, that's kind of awkward. Um, yeah, if you told me this like two weeks ago, I would have been like totally on board, but um, not anymore. So I'm gonna go. Here's a drawing of a dinosaur I did. You can hold on to that. Don't hold on to it for too long though, because that'll be weird if you still have it in five years. That'll be weird. I'm gonna go have fun being sad. It's also at this point that Onodera gives Raku her key to his lock. Uh, it is revealed at this point that Onodera is the girl that he made a promise with all those years ago. Uh, but since he has decided he's in love with Chitoge, she doesn't feel like she's deserving of the key. And so Raku, as he's walking up to Chitoge, opens up the lock and there's like some notes to future versions of themselves and rings. Um, I don't like this. A major kind of plot point throughout the entire story was people asking Raku, does it matter who the girl you made a promise with is? People kept asking him like, do your feelings for that person still matter? Do you still want to be with that person? Or does it, is it more important to you who you're in love with now? And he does decide that he's more interested in who he's in love with now. That person inevitably, be, inevitably being Chitoge. So I think it would have been a lot stronger if he had never opened the lock to begin with. To counterpoint myself, I understand that it would have been frustrating if he had never opened the lock and we never found out what was inside after the entire story kind of building up to this point. But if a major part of your, part of your plot is deciding that the lock isn't actually important, then I just think it would have been much stronger for it never to have been opened as like the ultimate symbol that whatever is inside of here, whatever this lock symbolizes, doesn't actually matter. It's more important who he cares about now. So I don't like that he opened the lock, but it's not some big story breaking thing. It's just for my own taste, I think it would have been a lot stronger if he had, I don't know, given Ono Dara the lock and she decided not to open it. And they just called it a day at that because they decided it doesn't matter, but they decided to open it anyway and make it matter. So whatever. And finally, Raku and Chitoge find each other, admit their love for one another, and get together. And it's all very happy. And it all is very nice. And everybody lived happily ever after, except for the five other girls who didn't get to get up on that dick. Now, I don't have a problem with this ending on the surface. Like I said, it's reasonably compelling. A lot of it makes sense. But uh, what does not make sense to me is Raku and Chitoge ending up together at the end of the story. Uh, it's no secret that I like Haru best and I think it makes the most sense for him to have ended up with Haru because they had an actual relationship, but that's not what I'm talking about. The thing that I'm talking about is that Raku and Chitoge did not have an actual relationship. Again, there's never really specific reasons given for why Raku falls in love with Chitoge or why Chitoge falls in love with Raku. They're all just very general. Like Raku likes Chitoge because they have fun together and Chitoge likes Raku because he's so nice and generous. That's not hyperbole, that's, that's basically what it is. I mean, again, there's a chapter at the end where, you know, Chitoge plans a date around what Raku likes and she has a miserable time. They have nothing in common. They have no common ground. They have no reason to want to be together. But this isn't to say that I think that they shouldn't be together because they're opposites and that I think that all romance stories should involve two people who have everything in common. That's not what I'm saying. And in order for me to explain why this ending doesn't work, I want to spoil the absolute shit out of Toradora. So this is your point of no return. If you haven't seen Toradora, you have to go watch it now if you have any interest in this kind of story. It is too goddamn good for me to spoil it for you. It's happening right now. You better leave. Get the fuck out of here and come back when you've watched that entire brilliant anime. 
The problem that I have is that I think a lot of writers see the opposites attract trope and are like, oh yeah, that makes sense. They're opposites, therefore they attract without trying to understand why in stories that use that trope and work, why that works. And this is an example of that. Ideally, the things that two characters are opposites on should somehow play off of each other in a complementary sort of way that builds a relationship between them, but instead of them just being opposites for basically no reason. In Toradora, Taiga is a complete and utter slob. Her apartment is a mess, she cannot cook, she can barely take care of herself, and she's always looking out for herself more than anybody else. Ryuji, on the other hand, is kind of a homemaker. He loves to cook, he loves to clean, for some reason gets super excited about it. So when they become friends, Ryuji starts like making lunches for her, cleaning up her apartment, watching out for her. And this is one of the things that she eventually ends up falling for him for, that he's always watching out for her and always there for her and always trying to take care of her. This is an effective usage of opposing characteristics in a romantic story like this. The things that they're opposites on, again, are playing off of each other to build a relationship between them. They aren't coming together because one is a slob and one is cleanly. They're coming together because one is a slob and one is cleanly and takes care of the other because they're a slob. The reason I bring this up is because Raku and Chitoge have basically the exact same opposing characteristics. Raku, while never overtly stated as liking cleaning, always keeps his space very organized and cleanly. And he does love cooking, that is a part of his character. Chitoge, on the other hand, is a complete and utter slob. Her room is constantly a mess, and when she cooks for people, it's bad. It makes people sick. Now, does this mean that Raku starts cooking for Chitoge and she falls in love with him because he's such a good cook or because he's always watching out to make sure that she's eating the right things? Not at all. Uh, Chitoge gets all of her meals prepared by like her family's head chef and Raku just cooks for his Yakuza family and those two characteristics don't intermingle at all unless it ha can ha somehow have some kind of comedic value. There's no way that they play off of each other besides that. So here are two things that they are opposites on that don't interact at all in, in order to form a relationship between the two of them. That's just bad writing. It's also somewhat insulting how little their like family situations are used to their advantage. In Toradora, Taiga and Duji both kind of feel like their families would be better off without them. Taiga is a child of divorce. Her dad really isn't involved in it with her life unless it somehow benefits him. And his mom has a family and a child with another husband. So she never really felt like a part of that family because part of that family is not her family. And Yuji has a single mom who is constantly working her ass off to make sure that he can live comfortably and like working a second job so that he can go to college and have a better life than she has. So he has to kind of think about like, what would my mom's life be like if I was never born? Would she get to eat better? Would she live a happier life? So he, you know, kind of feels like she'd be better off without him. So both of these characters don't feel like they really belong within their own families. So when their opposing characteristics start to play off each other and build a relationship between them, they find a belonging within each other, which strengthens their relationship at the end of the story. In Nisekoi, both of these characters are literally children of crime bosses. Like there is so much room to work with something there. There's so much room to make something there, but it's not used at all. In fact, that plot point is only used to explain why they're being forced in a pretend relationship. It's never used in any other way. You would be shocked how unimportant it is that they are both children of crime bosses. It's not important at all. <laughs> I'm not saying that every love story has to be written like Toradora. I'm sure someone's going to misinterpret it that way. But what I am saying is use the tools that you provide to yourself. God! That situation is used very briefly in the beginning. Uh, when Chitoge first transfers to the school, she's having trouble making friends because at previous schools she couldn't make friends because her family scared people off. Raku had the same problem and learned how to make friends anyway, so he helps her make friends. But that's the only time it's used, and that's not even referenced as like part of the reason that she falls in love with him. Like, come on. It's just so much wasted potential. And yet at the end of the story, the things that they fall in love with each other over are so incredibly vague. They're just, you know, very basic characteristics 
that could explain a lot of other people like, oh, you're very nice. That's why I want to fuck your brains out. Instead of, I don't know, we're both children of crime bosses who don't want to be involved with crime and who are forced into uncomfortable situations because of it. Therefore, we can find a comfortability in each other, not forcing each other into crime situations. I don't know. That's just something off the top of my head that isn't utilized. So the things that they're opposites on aren't being used to strengthen their relationships and the things that they're common on aren't being used to strengthen their relationships. So they're, they don't have a relationship. It doesn't exist. There's nothing there. So why should they end up together at the end of the story? Oops. While I was going through footage and chapters for this video, I was reminded that there are actually a few key moments where uh, Raku has a pretty significant impact on Chitoge's life. And I feel like it would be kind of inconsiderate of me to not bring it up. I don't know. I, I feel like someone's going to mention it if I don't bring it up myself. So Chitoge doesn't have a very good relationship with her mom and Raku kind of helps them reform their relationship. At one point in the story, it looks like Chitoge is going to have to move back to America with her family's gang, but uh, Raku does everything in his power to stop that from happening, even though he doesn't ultimately end up uh, changing anything. It was more Chitoge's own work that caused things to change. And so I realize now that it's perhaps supposed to be subtext that these instances created a relationship between these two characters, but I, I really don't agree with that. Events like that are the kinds of things that would kickstart feelings. You know, these are the kinds of things that I can see making Chitoge start to like Raku, but are still not a relationship between them, especially considering Chitoge does not do the same for Raku at any point in the story. She never has a real significant impact on anything that happens in his life. It's not like 50 years from now, Chitoge is going to be sitting there on their porch in their beautiful, you know, retirement home or something being like, Oh, Raku! I love you so much because 50 years ago, you reconnected me with my mother and stopped me from moving back to America, even though I then moved back to America of my own volition like a year later. That's why I've loved you for these past 50 years. That's not a relationship still. I can see those things kickstarting feelings, but it's still not a relationship. And I just felt like I needed to mention that. So uh, back to your regularly scheduled um, oh, over there. Look, I get it. When you write a story with six different love interests, people are going to disagree on who the ultimate pairing should be. But I think if you write a story like this intelligently, there can be no doubt that whoever they end up with at the end of the story is the person they belong with. And I want to stress again, because I'm sure someone's going to misinterpret it this way, that I'm not saying all this because I think he should have ended up with Haru. I say that because they had a relationship. I don't like the ending of this story because these two did not ever form a proper relationship. I think Chitoge would have been the most logical option if this was written correctly, but instead there's just a lot of wasted potential. And when you really think about it, there is no actual reason for them to have ended up together. Right up to the fucking end of the story, they don't enjoy being around each other. I mean, come on, am I crazy here? Like. What part of it makes sense? Clearly I'm an insane person because I have resorted to critically criticizing fucking manga plot lines. Like what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> but I don't know, after I finished the last chapter, it just kept banging around in my head and I kept thinking about things that didn't make sense. And whenever that kind of thing happens, I turn it into a video. That's, that's what motivates me ultimately to turn something, an idea into a video is when I can't stop thinking about it. So. I'm gonna look like an insane person, but I have just criticized the shit out of a stupid harem manga. Holy shit. While I was about halfway through editing this video, uh, my channel had a minor explosion of about 50,000 views and like 800 subscribers, which is insane to me. Thank you so much for watching my videos and subscribing and hopefully watching this one as well, all the way up to this point. It's kind of a longer one. Since I don't upload often on this channel, I figured I'd take this chance to tell you that if you want to see more from me, uh, I do have a podcast. Uh, I live stream on Twitch, and for people who have been watching me for a while, content like Captain's Kitchen, card opening videos, that's all getting moved to a second channel now. So for people who've been around for a while, go check out the second channel. For people who are new, also check out the second channel and those other things. They're all in the description. Seriously, I can't say it enough. Thank you so much for all the new subscribers and the support. The comments have been so insanely nice. It's been, it's, I, I've, I've said enough. 
that's all I've got to say. Thank you. To address the question that I'm ultimately going to get asked, uh, why, if I did not like this manga, did I keep reading it? If you can tell me the last time you saw a car wreck and you didn't stare at it, I will try to come up with an answer to that question. But for now, fuck off!